All right, welcome everyone to this week's HPL seminar. This week, our speaker is Shahab Elizabeth. Um, and Shahab did his undergraduate and master's degrees in sports sciences at the University of Tehran. Uh, he then did his PhD in human movement and training sciences, specializing in running kinematics at the University of Hamburg in Germany. Uh, from there, he started a postdoctoral fellowship at Memorial University and was there for four years? Three and a half years. Three and a half. Uh, and from there came to the University of Calgary and is a postdoc uh, with Ben O'Neill's group. Uh, he's currently working on identifying gait characteristics using uh, the Orpix insole for people with diabetes. Uh, but today he'll be telling us about some of his previous work, uh, the ineffectiveness of foam rolling. My goal for today's presentation is to shift your perspective on foam rolling. And instead of looking at it as an intervention, try to look at it as a form of warm up. Foam rolling is done by many individuals. You've probably seen it in some videos or in a gym, or you've probably done it yourself. The idea is that you use a cylindrical device, which is foam roller, and you target specific muscles by rolling over it. The intended benefits of a foam rolling is the improvement of range of motion. But first, I'm going to be introducing two different devices, which are considered to be this having the same application as foam rollers. First is the roller massage or the stick. The user intends to use this device, which is grabbed hold on by these handles and rolling the targeted muscle, in this case, the interior thigh. The level of load can be modified however the user pleases. The other benefit of this device is that it can be applied by another person, let's say by a physiotherapist. The next device is a uh, more conventional device is a, a foam roller. It's a cylindrical foam that comes in different sizes, different densities, and has different patterns all over it, which people believe that have benefits, like I said, in terms of range of motion. The difference between a foam roller and the stick is that the foam roller can be applied from the user only. By applying the foam roller to a portion of the body and using the portion of the body weight, the person slides or rolls on the foam roller forward and backward. They can control the amount of load while using their extremities on or off the floor. Now I want to talk about the first study, one of the very first studies that used one of these two devices. I'm going to be starting with the stick. Back in 2002, Mike Keski recruited 30 people. These people were all athletes. NCAA Division II athletes, and they targeted their hamstring muscles with the stick. They, their intervention was a two-minute foam rolling on the hamstring, but prior to that, they had a five-minute warm-up. I want to draw your attention to this warm-up, which is going to be a repeated statement throughout some of the slides that I will be presenting. Their results show that the amount of passive hip flexion after rolling the hamstrings for two minutes showed that it did not improve passive hip flexion range of motion. Now, the downside of this study was that they only used post measurements instead of a traditional pre and post measurements. This study was set aside 
And then later, 10 years later than that, 2013, McDonald performed another study instead with a foam roller. They recruited 20 people, and this time they targeted the quadriceps muscle. Just like the previous study, they warmed up for five minutes, low intensity warm up, and their intervention was two sets of 60 second foam rolling on the quadriceps. Unlike the previous study, they had three time points of measurements, the pre, post two minutes of intervention, and post 10 minutes. And they assessed the amount of knee flexion in that study. And what they found was that in the foam rolling group, the two post measurements were significantly different from the pre. The control did not show any statistically significant difference from the pre-measurement, i.e. range of motion improvement. This study started a cascade of research that people started targeting different body, a different body region, different muscles, and using different interventions. However, most of the interventions, the protocols were either very arbitrary or they were anecdotal. So in Memorial, we started to gather these studies and come up with a uh, guideline, a set of protocols that people can use in their research and as well as their activities. We found through the studies that were conducted up until the point 2020, that one to three sets of foam rolling with a rolling time of two to four seconds and a set duration of 30 to 120 seconds is enough to have the benefits of improving the range of motion. Now, the number of sets and set duration is pretty self-evident. However, rolling time indicates the amount of time it takes for the individual to either roll upwards or downwards. With that in mind, we did a follow-up study using these guidelines, but using the bare minimum recommendation. So using one set of two, roll, uh, two second rolling time and a 30 set duration time. We use two different devices of foam rolling for our study. One is the conventional cylindrical foam roller and another one in the shape of the ball. Our aim was to compare these two devices with each other and see whether or not either one has an additional benefit. Our idea was that since the ball has a very small surface area, it will apply more pressure, hence a greater improvement in range of motion. We recruited 20 people for this study. We targeted two muscles, but first I'm gonna be uh, presenting the calf muscle, a low intensity warm up, and our intervention, as I said, was a single set of 30 second rolling with two second rolling time. And comparing the results for the ankle dorsiflexion, the range of motion was measured through the knee to wall test. And the distance created between the toe and the wall in centimeters was used as a representation of the ankle dorsiflexion. We found that neither of these devices had any effect or any improvement on range of motion. Similarly, on the hamstrings, we did the same thing. And for our knee range of motion test, we conducted the, the active knee extension test. And again, we found that the foam rolling or neither of these devices had any effect on range of motion improvement. Now that got us wondering and start questioning of why that is. Is it the protocol? Is it the intervention? What is it? Are we looking 
at a wrong place. So we gathered the study again and started looking at the possible mechanisms that people speculate and suggest for improvement in range of motion using a foam roller. These mechanisms are changes in fascicle length, muscle activation, tissue stiffness, pain modulation, and blood perfusion. We're going to be going through them one by one, and we're going to be seeing how these have an effect or lack of effect, if you will. Start, I'm going to be starting with the fascicle length. The fascicle length of a fiber is measured between the uh, superficial and deep apineurosis, and it's typically measured through an ultrasound machine. Now, the idea of why a fascicle length is changed with foam rolling is the same idea of a, a very long duration stretching for a long period of time. Some gain of range of motion when applying a, in, an intense long duration stretching can happen through changes in the fascicle length. And people were wondering if the foam roller can break down the fascia so that it can also increase the fa fascicle length. With that in mind, Yoshimura at, uh, in 2021 recruited 22 people and they targeted the gastric nemius muscle, specifically the medial head. Again, they performed a five minute warm up, and their intervention was three sets of 60 second foam rolling with a one second rolling time. The graph over here represents the fascicle length that was measured at different ankle angles at 30 degree plantar flexion, all the way to 80% of maximum dorsiflexion. On the y axis, it represents the differences in length with respect to the ankle at zero degrees. And they had, so in the uh, light gray, you will see the control pre and in black, control post, light green, the foam rolling pre and dark green foam roller post. And conducting the analysis, they found that foam rolling did not change the fascicle length. So we can cross that off our list. Next is the muscle activation. Muscle activation is typically measured through EMG. On the top, you can see a raw demonstration on, of the EMG, and on the bottom is the RMS calculated over a 60 second duration. What people typically use as a measurement is the uh, maximum RMS values at given time point. The idea behind using muscle activation was that increased muscle activation is linearly related to increased muscle stiffness. Thus, if foam rolling is able to reduce the muscle activation in a certain activity, then we can expect the uh, ranges of motion to be improved. With that in mind, Kavanaugh in 2017 conducted a study where they recruited 80 par 18 participants, where they targeted the hamstring muscle. The biceps femoris EMG activation was used in a uh, drop jump test, and people performed four sets of 45 second foam rolling with a one and a half second rolling time. When comparing the biceps femoris EMG activation, peak activation in re uh, with regards to the peak activation during an isometric MVC, they found quite surprisingly, again, no effect on the EMG. So out of the five, possible mechanisms, two did not support the idea of improvement in ranges of motion. Next is the tissue stiffness. 
the way typically the uh, tissue stiffness is measured is through the ultrasound and um, elastography. The shear wave uh, modulus is used as a measurement of the muscle stiffness, where the probe is placed onto the uh, targeted region and, the, and a low frequency pulse called the push is generated towards the tissue and perpendicular to that pulse, the displacement is occurred throughout the tissue. Over here, the red indicates a stiffer region. And as the waves are propagated throughout the tissue, you can see in stiffer regions, the amount of um, propagation actually reduces, which is indicated by this red shading area over the green. Down here is the formulation that is used for shear modulus, the mu, which is in kilopascals, and the rho, which is the mu uh, muscle densi uh, density. The V represents the speed of the propagation of these waves. With that in mind, a study was conducted by Morales in 2017, where they recruited 14 people. The hamstring muscle, again, were targeted, but this time there was no warm-up, unlike the other slides where I mentioned that there was a warm-up. Instead of a warm-up, they conducted 10 sets of 60-second foam rolling with two-second rolling time, as well as a 10-minute cycling activity. And they compared the sheer modulus with relative to the pre-measurement that they conducted post five minutes and post 30 minutes. And what they found was surprising. And it was that cycling post five minutes and post 30 minutes had a reduced amount of tissue stiffness compared to the control and compared to the pre. The foam rolling only had a reduction in the amount of st tissue stiffness compared to uh, the pre in post five minutes. No significant difference was found in post 30 minutes. So we can say that the tissue stiffness is a possible mechanism to consider. Next is pain modulation. This is more of a subjective measurement, but nevertheless, it gives us valuable information. There are two possible theories behind why we would expect pain modulation. The first one is hypoalgesic effect of exercise. In a simple term, we're saying that exercise reduces pain sensitivity. Now, if you consider foam rolling as a form of exercise, we can speculate that it does reduce pain sensitivity. And a reduction in pain sensitivity means greater improvement in ranges of motion. Why that is? It is because when we're measuring the ranges of motion, we're typically taking the people or the person to their maximum tolerable stretch limit. And if we can modulate their pain sensation, we can go to further extents in their ranges of motion. Next is the diffuse noxious inhibitory control. In simple terms, pain reduces pain. If any of you have ever done a set of foam rolling, especially on the anterior thigh or the IT band, you've came to notice that it's quite painful. And using the painful stimuli we're able to reduce the pain sensitivity through the flexibility test. So with these two possible theories, we can measure the sensitivity, pain, sensitivity of the pain or pain modulation through a handheld ergometer. This handheld ergometer is positioned, the probe is positioned on the targeted muscle and the examiner is applying the pressure gradually. We asked the participant to um, 
signal when they sense the ch uh, changes uh, of the sensation from pressure to pain. And then we take the reading typically in kilograms from the device. With that in mind, Kasahara at 2000, uh, in 2022 recruited 14 participants where they targeted their quadriceps muscle. Their intervention consisted of three sets of 60 second foam rolling with two seconds of rolling time. Again, they did not have a warm up protocol prior to foam rolling. For both control and foam rolling, they had five different time points where they took the uh, pain pressure threshold, which is an indication of pain sensitivity measurement. The higher the uh, PPT, the lower the sensitivity of pain. Thus, after conducting these results, they found that the foam roller group immediately after foam rolling had a significant increase in the pain pressure threshold which means decreased in pain sensitivity. No other significant differences were reported. So now we have two theories that support the idea of improving ranges of motion and two th theories that do not. And the last but not least is blood perfusion. And it's typically measured through, again, ultrasound, and using the Doppler setting. Using the Doppler setting, we can measure the amount of blood flow, in this case, the speed of uh, blood cells that are passing through a certain region by emitting the frequency from a certain frequency from the probe to the blood cells. As the blood cells are moving towards the probe, the frequency radiated towards the probe is higher. And the, when the blood cells are moving away from the probe, the frequency radiated back is lower. Using these information, we can calculate the amount of velocity of the blood in that specific region. With that in mind, Hotfield in 2017 recruited 21 participants. They targeted the lateral thigh, and their intervention consisted of three sets of 45 second foam rolling with a rolling time of two seconds in each direction. On the Y axis, it's the peak blood flow uh, represented in centimeters per second. And over here, when compared to pre, the po immediately post and uh, 30 minutes post intervention showed an incre increase in blood perfusion. Now, given that they didn't have a control group to compare to, but nevertheless, they did see a increase in blood perfusion in that region, in the lateral thigh. Now, having said all of this, where does this lead to? Now comes the question, is foam rolling a warm-up with all the information that we already presented? because tissue stiffness, regardless if it's a foam rolling or light cycling activity, it does reduce the uh, tissue stiffness. Pain can be modulated either through exercise, a lightweight exercise, or even foam rolling, and blood perfusion can be expected to increase in also light activities, a warm up, if you will. That made us think and conduct the next study where we, con where we compared the foam rolling versus a sham rolling. Like any other conventional foam roller, we used the cylindrical foam roller and rolled the hamstring of the participants. But for the sham rolling, we used a dolly, a platform on four wheels that we tried to mimic the task of a foam rolling by asking the participant to roll forward and backward on the, on the device. We recruited 20 participants and we targeted the hamstring muscles. Our intervention consisted of four sets of 45 second duration with a two second rolling time. 
the passive hip flexion range of range of motion was taken as our range of motion measurement. And we can see from our results that the sham rolling and form rolling both increased in passive hip uh, flexion ranges of motion. So the only difference was that we, we have taken out the form rolling device, the device that was believed to have an improvement in ranges of motion. And we replace it with a complete sham, a placebo, if you will. And we still saw improvement in ranges of motion. Now the take home message would be form rolling can be substituted with a warm up to improve joint range of motion. And I would like to thank my previous supervisor, Dr. David Bain at Memorial University, all my other collaborators and Memorial uh, University students. Thank you. Next presentation. Do you have any idea uh, which tissues are using stiffness? Like, you know, you're measuring right. stiffness across the entire muscle, but muscles close to many structures. Right. Is there any evidence? Do you have any idea what specifically is? Uh, you mean either it's the muscle or the tendon? Yeah, or like the. They were targeting the muscle specifically. So in the uh, study, um, for this one, they were targeting the hamstring biceps femoris over here. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I guess I'm getting more into like the, I think it's, it's just not possible, I guess, to answer the question. Like what specifically within the muscle itself, you know, or is the right. sort of reduce, you know, the improvement in, mm -hmm. in stiffness coming from like the passive Tissue, right. Um, I that's a great question. I would not know, um, but yeah, that's the thing that they measured, and uh, yeah. Sure. Uh, oh, why does the improvement in pain sensitivity dissipate so quickly? Um. Well, there are many uh, beliefs because it's very transient in a sense that the pain, pain sensation kind of subsides. And if you want to keep that sensitivity low, you have to be performing those activities uh, over a very long per period of time, such as I came across a study where they compared endurance athletes with normal people and even resistance training athletes. And because they were like uh, subjected to different modes of training or pain, if you will, they had a higher pain tolerance compared to normal people. So if you want to potentially keep that advantage, you have to have it over a long duration. And all of these studies that I showed here today were the acute effects, not necessarily the long-term effects. So this is it's basically like a, a pain memory, like a pain is just relative time? It is relative. So, yeah. Uh, in your last study there, yeah. if you can go to your last slide with your interventions right there, uh, do you think that the sham condition actually caused similar uh, tissue deformation that the foam roller did? They would both be pressing on the same um, or iterating the same cutaneous afferents and the, the, the stretch reflex the same way on those muscles as well. You mean the amount of pressure that is yeah. being applied through the dolly? The body weight? Those muscles there, you're still going to be activating some of the same afferent pathways. Mm, I'm not quite sure about that, but what I would, uh, what we aim to do is, tr you know, only mimicking the uh, foam rolling movement would be enough to have the warm up effect that we're looking for. So, um, in the regards of, you know, changing the afferent information, um, I honestly do not know. Um, but yeah, I, I would believe that it would have an effect on that. I suspect there'd be some global spinal right. um, modulations that are happening here that can actually change to some increases mm -hmm. in flexibility and maybe some changes in performance too. Right. Um, even just holding yourself in that position. Yes. It may, not, it may, it may be a passive 
exercise for the muscle that's being rolled, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of other active muscles in the body that can contribute to these spinal pathways too. So right, right. I mean, the smallest um, in our studies that we did, which was not related to foam rolling, uh, even the slightest thing that you mentioned, like even moving your head or opening your eyes can modulate the uh, central nervous system, you know, um, changing the overall uh, excitability, hence potentially leading to changes in the ranges of motion, possibly. But uh, for this particular study, we did not conduct such a uh, measurement for this one. Yeah. I asked because I graduated from the same uh, right. lab. I was a, I studied with Dr. Brain. Dr. Brain, yeah. You said it a couple times here. <laughs> here we go. I've got a not a not not a very traditional question. I noticed this is funded by a my tax. I was thinking, why would so correct me if I'm wrong, maybe I'm assuming that a foam roller company was okay. I would see that this is a very high risk type of project for a company like that, mm -hmm. right? Like you, you, you do this project show that there's essentially no effect of foam rolling, mm -hmm. or, you know, you say it's as effective as a, a warm up. Mm -hmm. I would think that not funding the project and not having the scientific data saying that it's ineffective mm -hmm. would be much better for the company than scientific data saying it's ineffective. You know what I'm saying? I, when you when you talk to the company, like, mm -hmm. did you get a like? Were they a really small company? They were really interested in the science, or uh, and then maybe can you can you just talk about what the interactions were like as much as you can, right? When you sort of presented these results to them and what what their interpretation was. So they are a very small company. Uh, by no means they are a very big company, and when we presented this idea before receiving the funding, most of the literature, like I said, was showing that there was an improvement in ranges of motion. The mechanism behind it wasn't clear. So, you know, when you're, I would believe, because I didn't directly approach the company, my supervisor did. So when you present that data and you would speculate that, okay, so this device may have an additional benefit because of this, because of the features that you provide, then you know, they can be convinced of, um, you know, uh, taking on that study for at least two years, I would say. That's my uh, best guess. Yeah, okay, no, that, that clarifies some things. Because after receiving the funding, we started those studies that I was, uh, you know, our team was part of. So uh, the sham rolling, as well as the uh, study with the ball and traditional foam roller. And their interpretation of your findings? Did you ever we just that? submitted uh, the reports. We haven't heard back from them yet. Thank you. <laughs> you started out, you talked about that these foam rollers come in uh, different sizes, mm -hmm. different patterns, you know, surface patterns, different uh, squeezability, different mm -hmm. um, did you Did you test uh, differences between different designs our group didn't but i did come across uh, studies that have utilized different patterns and also different stiffness and basically compared to a traditional foam roller there wasn't any additional benefit they both showed an improvement in range of motion but having ridges or patterns or different levels of stiffness wasn't that much of an improvement in range of motion compared to the traditional foam rollers. The, uh, the one thing that also surprised me is when you look at range of motion, because uh, do you think the muscles are limiting, are the limiting factor for knee flexion, for example? I mean, some people get knee flexion. Mm, not necessarily, no. I, I, I didn't think so, and so, so even if your muscle got stiff or less stiff, like for the dorsiflexion, mm -hmm. I can see that. You know, I think in dorsiflexion, probably your your triceps superior group might be probably limiting ankle mm -hmm. dorsiflexion, but uh, for some of the joints, I just didn't see what the muscles. Right, uh, not none. That's why we 
try to present all the different mechanisms that may support the idea of why foam rollers may improve the uh, ranges, uh, the improvement in range of motion. I would say, uh, from the recent studies that I came across, the most important factor is the amount of pain modulation. So the sensitivity of the pain actually um, decreases after a set of foam rolling. So um, I would put that as my primary um, supporting argument uh, for an acute study rather than changes in stiffness or uh, blood perfusion. Uh, regardless, they do have an effect, but I would put pain modulation as my primary supporting argument. I always thought as foam rolling as a form of like massage. Mm -hmm. I mean, athletes, you know, get their weekly massages. Mm -hmm. They they don't get that to improve their range of motion. I mean, they get that presumably for recovery purposes, for mm -hmm. preventing muscle injuries and those type of things. So have people looked at other aspects of foam rolling rather than range of motion? They did look at um, the effects of foam rolling on uh, delayed onset muscle soreness. They also looked at um, foam rolling on different aspects of performance. And they're quite divided between them in sense that um, some suggest that there is an Im improvement in the performance, uh, such as, let's say, uh, uh, the jump height. Um, but there are other studies that say that there is no effect on that. But in DOMS, again, uh, Greg Piercy uh, in Memorial conducted a study where they showed that uh, athletes that experienced DOM with a set of 10 sets of 10 squats at 80% of their maximum showed that their amount of pain uh, reduced after a set, uh, session of foam rolling. I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, Tim Butterfield studies uh, in Kentucky, where he did, he induced eccentric injury, I think in a rabbit, rabbit quadriceps muscles. Mm -hmm. And then he had this device, mm -hmm. a, a rabbit massager, but it essentially was a roller that went back and forth from the muscles. Right. And he found a whole bunch, you know, like blood flow increase mm -hmm. like you, and and, and he found that in the repair of muscle that was damaged, that seemed to actually help. Right. Um, yeah, uh, I do see that happening because if I think about it again, like I said, if it's a form of exercise, a lightweight weight exercise, then I would expect the recovery, if you will, to happen faster. If people are um, inducing the eccentric damages to the muscle, a lightweight form of exercise um, may help mitigate that painful sensation or the damages itself because you're increased, increasing the blood flow and also modulating the pain. That's what I would expect to happen um, also in the rat studies as well as um, human studies. I have a couple of very specific and small questions. Maybe at the end I stop here for others. Uh, so you kind of are, you've already touched on some of this, but uh, with the different patterns and whatnot, does different thicknesses or uh, sort of surface area for applying that pressure make mm. a difference? Because I guess just anecdotally, the teams I've trained on have always used lacrosse balls instead mm -hmm. of foam rollers, right. uh, which would apply for a much smaller. Much smaller, yeah. Um, with the ball study that we did, um, our intention was first to see whether or not the uh, overall shape, like you say, surface area has an effect. It did induce a more pain painful sensation as the people were rolling, but uh, in our measurements, such as range of motion and force production, um, it really didn't make any difference, realistically. Yeah. Is the do you have any idea about uh, user experience in, in, in this study here? Yeah, like if both of these are equivalent, do people prefer one versus the other? They perform the foam rolling. I was one of the participants. Yeah. Um, it's easier to uh, glide on. 
uh, as, a, as opposed to the dolly. Um, and also you have, um, this is me personally experience, uh, speaking, and you have that sensation of the massage, if you will. Uh, so preferences go to the traditional foam roller instead of a uh, dolly. So the placebo effect is really high. <coughs> Like because it feels painful and it seems like you're doing something, people believe it works. Is that kind of like? Uh, I would still boil it down to the warm up effects because it is quite um, like I'm not gonna say very exhaustive, but it is ta uh, taxing on your you know on your body because 60 seconds following a metronome for doing that for four sets is a little bit um, like you definitely feel that you're getting warmed up because of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, just thinking about the question of Walter and uh, and Michael, um, like for some movements, uh, as Walter said, like the muscles are not like limited to the range of motion. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know about studies maybe like just looking at the passive force at different joint angles? The passive force at different joint angles. As we don't exactly know what structures inside the muscles mm -hmm. can change right. maybe like if you're just going in extreme position you will have like kind of the same stiffness or the same range of motion right. but if you're going like only like on certain structures because like your angle is less than mm -hmm. your max maybe you can find differences there so if i understood your question correctly when there were a couple of studies that used the uh, <clears throat> passive um, torque to measure the stiffness and what they found that after a uh, intervention of foam rolling it did not change the stiffness in that sense but when they used the ultrasound and the uh, shear modulus measurements they found a difference i was just going to ask in that regard with changes in stiffness with like the elastography how much, if any, can be ascribed just to changes in tissue temperature? Like, would this mm -hmm. induce any measurable changes in temperature? And have people look at sitting in a hot tub like right. the same? I, don't know. I have not come across th those studies, but I would assume, as you are, and as I pointed out, warming up as a result of foam rolling, you would expect an increase in temperature in the overall uh, like body. So, not targeting specific regions because. Um, one of the uh, features of the foam rolling company that funded the study had a, a heating element inside of the ball, which realistically couldn't be uh, transferred into the deep tissues and could be dissipated um, on the surface. That itself did not have any additional benefits if it's just heating, let's say. couple of smaller questions. Uh, in the McDonald's study, you know where they found the, the difference with the, uh, with the foam rolling. Mm -hmm. I was surprised because it seemed the, the difference between the two control groups mm -hmm. you know, before seemed to be as big as the effect that was shown. And uh, so I'm wondering what that effect you know, would be uh, at this one. Right. If I look at the control group, you know, I don't know if that is 70 and then the foam rolling control is before, you know, is like 78 or so, and it's eight degrees difference or so, I'm guessing. And then the effect seems to be about that same difference. Right. So I wonder how relevant that is if two control groups before could have a similar difference as what the effect is supposed to be. Right. Um... That's a great question. Um, I couldn't think from the top of my head of um, what the uh, justification was because, you know, comparing the uh, pre measurements in the control and foam roller. But I know they had a repeated design model. So, same subjects coming in different days. Um, I'm I couldn't really remember which analysis method they use and whether or not they took these differences into consideration. Um, it, it's just, you know, I, I believe all the differences that I'm seeing. I'm just surprised that 
presumably, you know, uh, I guess you, did you have 20 subjects in each group or 20 total? No, 20 in each condition, so in each group. In each group. Yeah, just, I'm just surprised that the control group before and the phone group before, those, those are the same measurements, aren't they? I mean, yeah. They, there's nothing done yet. I was just surprised how big the difference was. But anyway. Can I that? Because we did a whole bunch of studies like that. Sure. Yeah. Um, I was there, and um, the, the test for range of motion is actually like a static stretch mm -hmm. almost, right? So in this case, they're looking at the quadriceps. So in the pre-test, they would have had to actually stretch that muscle as far as they could to get that angle measurement, right? Which in itself would actually be like an intervention. It could actually, oh, um, on that, that post-test, could have an effect, which could help to explain why the range of motion is bigger in the post-test than it is like in terms of control. I thought. I thought I had the picture, so I want to bring it up. So um, I didn't. <laughs> I, I, I deleted it, deleted it from the slides. Excuse me. So yeah, the next one. Okay. You know the question I had. You just made a very short comment saying that activation was linearly related to mm -hmm. stiffness. Yeah. Who has shown that? It hasn't been shown. That's the thing. It is speculated. And in the uh, when you go through the, especially in the discussion methods, they are saying that the level of activation is linearly uh, correlated with muscle stiffness. And I too don't believe that. That's why I brought it up as a possible mechanism to show that that's not the case necessarily. I, I, I would assume it's not, but obviously I don't know either. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the other thing, uh, Rob Herbert did a really interesting study, I thought, you know, about like passive length changes and passive properties and stiffness. And so uh, what he did is he measured what he called the slack lengths of fascicles, I think in the, in the knee extensor. So, so the, the fascicles are kind of you know, wiggly, yeah. and then he bends the knee, and then he sees when they are straight and then they start elongating. That's what he called the slack lengths. And right. so when people stretch, then that slack length occurs at a longer muscle length. Right. But then the interesting thing is then they just activate the muscle quickly and it immediately goes back mm -hmm. to the old slack length after the stretching. Mm -hmm. you know, does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. Yeah. So, so my question to that is, is, did you control how if people, mm -hmm. when they measured the, the uh, extension there, whether or not before or after the range of motion testing, they were doing certain activation or what, or was that control? Because according to you know, Rob Herbert, that would influence that slack length and might potentially influence flexibility of muscles. So um, are you asking that prior to measuring the ranges of motion, were they doing certain activities and we, were we controlling for that? Yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing a foam rolling. Right. And now you're doing a range of motion test. Right. What do I do between the foam rolling and I kept passive and I just sit there and- Oh, okay. Testing. Or mm -hmm. my people say, oh, you know, I kind of stand up and I and kind of shake. Them up. No, we, we didn't really allow for that, uh, you know, uh, moving about. It was very simple. We guided them through the protocol in that sense. Uh, in a sense that they being completely passive, that was not controlled for, but it wasn't to the extent that people after a set of foam rolling, they were jumping up and down or like doing leg kicks or anything like that. It was just doing foam rolling, going on the uh, physiotherapy table and starting measuring the... Uh, The last question would be, do you use the foam roller? If you want a form of warm-up, sure, why not? Are you using the foam roller? Oh, for me? Um, I'm not currently exercising because of the amount of workload that I have. But <laughs> <laughs> so once you have less work and you get back to exercising, will you use the foam roller? Um, I would use it, yes, yeah, but not as a replacement. So let's say as a, a warm up on a, a treadmill, it's gonna be a very light 
like um, exercise for me if I'm if I were uh, like start exercising again. I just one last question: Has anyone ever looked at? like changes in hand pressure threshold correlation with changes in range of motion? They did. Um, the only reason that I didn't bring those studies into the slide was that they did not include a, a control group. And once you, you know, exclude the uh, control group, you cannot really make any good statement about the efficacy of the training, but they did um, uh, looked at the correlation and they found a, there is a direct correlation between the level of pain pressure threshold and increases in range of motion. Um, so in the studies that have looked at whether foam rolling helps with uh, dogs, um, mm -hmm. have they compared that sort of like static or dynamic stretching with So the studies that induced the DOMS and also had foam rolling interventions, did they have static stretching intervention as well? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, they compared it to like, static stretching and dynamic stretching as well? Or... I couldn't really remember with that regards. Um, the only study that I can think about is um, Greg Piercy's study that only used the foam roller. And um, yeah, that's that's what I can think of right now. Any last questions? Okay, thank you.